Good afternoon and welcome to Transforming Chaplaincy Celebration of Spiritual Care Week and to today's webinar, Chaplaincy and Mental Health, Reviewing the Evidence. I'm Andrew Andresco, Project Coordinator for Transforming Chaplaincy, and we are delighted you could join us. Some housekeeping instructions off the top. This webinar is being recorded. You are listening in using your computer speaker system by default and are muted. Should you have any technical questions regarding your audio or visual, please type those into the chat box located in the platform's dashboard. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions for our presenters by typing your questions into the questions box of that same control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and hope to include them during the Q&A session at the end of today's event. With that, I'd like to introduce Chaba Salaji, Director of Transforming Chaplaincy. Thank you, Andy. Um, uh, happy Spiritual Care Week to everyone, and thank you for joining us again, or first time during Spiritual Care Week. Um, we have had some excellent webinars this week uh, with really great response and viewership, and we continue this uh, uh, for today as well. Uh, today is our last set, uh, webinar for Spiritual Care Week, but this is the first of part three, the part one of three webinars. So this is part one, and um, and we're going to continue this uh, topic in January and February as well. Um, as you see on the screen, uh, the QR code and a link to our spiritual care webpage. Um, as uh, with the previous webinars, we posted the, the link to the recordings and some other resources on this page. And you will also find in information about our new uh, chaplaincy and mental health care uh, research network that we are launching. Um, this network connects chaplains into professional colleagues, researchers, and leaders to advance the integration of chaplaincy and mental health care through research and evidence-based practices across the continuum of care. Um, and I um, also uh, would like to introduce uh, today's presenters. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Rachel, uh, Rachel uh, Daly and uh, Kirsten Amos. Uh, Rachel is a chaplain specialist at the Ascension Housing and Health Alliance in Chicago, which provides stable housing and support services for people impacted by substance use and chronic illness. Uh, she has previous chaplaincy experience in medical, surgical, inpatient care and behavioral health and also completed the Transforming Chaplaincy Spiritual Care Management and Leadership Program in 2022. Kirsten Amos um, is a staff chaplain with Grace Hospice in Minneapolis. She has previous chaplaincy experience in pediatrics, palliative care, behavioral health, and ethics. She will be published in the forthcoming uh, case study book, uh, Case Studies in Pediatric Chaplaincy. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, we are also delighted to share two book discounts with you for Spiritual Care Week. And uh, thank you to the publishers for making these available to us. Um, the first book is The Transforming Chaplaincy, um, the George Fitchett Reader. Uh, use this code to receive 40% discount. And, um, and this reviews George Fitchett's pioneering uh, research work over the decades. And this collection offers an ideal introduction to spiritual care uh, research. Next slide, please. We have uh, we can offer a 20% discount uh, for the evidence-based healthcare chaplaincy, a research reader. Um, this book is also a great overview and introduction to the field of healthcare chaplaincy research with wide-ranging topics. And again, this is a really great resource for an overview or an introductory text if anybody wants to get familiar with chaplaincy research. And uh, lastly, um, I also want to highlight our ongoing fundraising campaign. We are at about 70% of our fundraising goal for 2023. And uh, if you find our webinars and resources valuable, uh, please consider uh, supporting Transforming Chaplaincy. So with all this, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Kirsten and uh, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chaba, for that introduction. Rachel and I are very excited to be here today to present our webinar, Chaplaincy and Mental Health, Reviewing the Evidence. As Chaba said, this is the first in a set of three webinars. They will take the perspective of an evidence-based approach to chaplaincy and mental health. 
our upcoming webinars will be chaplaincy and mental health, utilizing clinical expertise, and then chaplaincy and mental health, empowering chaplains for integration. Since we're taking this perspective of evidence-based care, it's best to start this time together just by defining what is evidence-based care and why we think it's a helpful lens for this. A practitioner engages in evidence-based care when they are using three things in the provision of their care. The first would be the best available data or research that is relevant to the discipline they work in. The next would be using their own clinical expertise. And then finally, being attentive to the individual patient or care recipient in front of them. When a practitioner is using all three of these in the care they are providing, they are engaging in evidence-based care. It's important to note that evidence-based care is not being directed or dictated by evidence. There have been many disciplines, chaplaincy included, that have often been a bit afraid of evidence-based care because of fear that it would actually remove the individuality of both the care recipient and the clinician. And rather, the goal here is to use evidence in a helpful way. We find that there are many benefits to evidence-based care. Um, when practitioners utilize evidence in their work, we find it broadens their clinical knowledge, it strengthens their skill sets, and when people have more knowledge and more skill, not surprisingly, they pro provide more effective care, and not surprisingly, more effective care leads to better care outcomes. We felt this would be particularly helpful for mental health in chaplaincy, because many chaplains express trepidation around working with mental health. They might not be familiar, they're not sure how to approach it, and they want to provide good care. This appeared to be a great way to build chaplain confidence by uh, building more knowledge and skill in mental health. So this webinar today is gonna to focus on that first part of evidence-based care. We're gonna be presenting a pretty expansive literature review, looking at lots of different aspects related to chaplaincy and mental health. And our future webinars are going to address the other aspects of evidence-based care. Before we jump into the literature review, we're going to cover two quick definitions just for clarity. Um, our first is chaplaincy. When we're saying chaplaincy in this presentation, we are referring to the work of clinicians who have specialized training in spiritual care, such as CPE, and are working in an institution in either a paid or volunteer capacity as a chaplain. And when we refer to mental health, we recognize mental health is a pretty big term. Um, in this presentation, we're referring to it more with mental illnesses and substance use, and we're going to be using it interchangeably with behavioral health. So with that, let's jump into it. So we'll begin this literature review by reviewing some of the evidence related to mental health, mental illness, and what we know about how these impact the people in the communities that we care for. And one of the first things to note about mental illness is that it is very, very common. About one in five U.S. adults are impacted by mental illness each year. And this means that most likely all of us have someone within our family, in our close circle, or we ourselves who are currently impacted by mental illness. These um, rates are even higher when we look at young adults. Among young adults uh, ages 18 to 25 in the United States, about one in three are impacted by mental illness each year. While those um, data reflect prevalence within a given year, if we zoom out and look across the lifespan at lifetime prevalence, in the United States, about half of people will meet the criteria for a diagnosable mental health condition at some point in our lives. It's important to note that these numbers only reflect people who meet the clinical criteria for a diagnosis. Uh, there are many more people who experience challenges related to mental health that might cause distress and disruption, um, but if they're below that threshold for a diagnosis, those experiences would not be reflected in this data. Um, and so we see that most of us will experience mental health struggles at some point in our lives. Mental health is closely related to other dimensions of health, which is what is depicted in the figure on this slide. So for individuals with a chronic medical illness, there's a greater susceptibility to a co-occurring mental disorder um, as the stress of a medical problem can negatively impact mental health. And this relationship is bi-directional, which means that the reverse is also true. Um, so for individuals with uh, a mental health problem, there's greater risk for a co-occurring medical problem likely due to additional difficulty or barriers around maintaining health. 
We also see quite a few shared risk factors, such as adverse childhood experiences, um, socioeconomic factors, and these increase the likelihood of developing both mental and medical health problems. And these relationships are reflected in the data that show that comorbidity between mental and medical disorders is the norm. Um, as chaplains, we typically encounter people who are um, in the midst of some significant stress, maybe related to a health issue or some other life crisis. And in these circumstances, because the dimensions of health are so interconnected, we can expect to see higher rates of mental health problems than what we would see in the general population. Mental illnesses vary in their severity, um, but we do observe significant and wide ranging impacts across life domains associated with mental illness. Uh, these domains include education, employment, and personal relationships. These impacts can be direct due to the nature of mental illness symptoms themselves, and they can also be indirect due to experiences of stigma that cause additional suffering for people with mental illness. And I share a few data points to give us some sense of the magnitude of these impacts. Um, mental disorders are the leading cause of disability in the United States. Several mental illnesses are also associated with dramatic reductions in life expectancy on the, on the order of 10 to 20 years. Among jail and prison inmates, rates of serious mental illness are four times higher compared to the general population. And so the struggles that many experience related to mental health cause significant suffering, loss of life, and often are effectively criminalized. Um, here's another sobering statistic. Half of US adults with a mental illness receive no treatment of any kind. The primary reason that people give for not being able to access uh, treatment is due to cost, due to treatment not being affordable. A stigma is another major factor. There's both internal as well as external or public stigma that impact treatment seeking behavior and can lead people to avoid or delay seeking help for a mental health problem. A report from Mental Health America earlier this year put it this way, the system is built such that only people with higher incomes can afford to receive care. And so we see that the social determinants of health have a major impact on mental health in terms of prevalence and severity, as well as impacting treatment access and the quality of treatment. And I'll illustrate this with just a few examples. Um, LGBTQ plus individuals are twice as likely to experience mental illness compared to heterosexual individuals. Among some communities of color, while depression is not necessarily more prevalent, it has been found to be more persistent, more severe, and more disabling. And while I shared a moment ago that only about 50% of US adults receive treatment for their mental illness, these rates are even lower, um, sometimes dramatically lower among racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, we also observe impacts in terms of the quality of care that's received and the likelihood of receiving evidence-based treatments. And these are just examples of the many intersectional factors that contribute to significant disparities in mental health outcomes. So from this evidence, what is relevant and important for us to understand? First of all, mental health challenges are very common and they're not limited to mental health settings. We can expect to see mental health concerns anytime we are encountering other human beings. Um, and these concerns are gonna be particularly prevalent if we look at settings like healthcare, like jails or prisons, um, any setting with young adults like a college or university, um, or any other environment where people are experiencing stress, trauma, or significant disruption. We also know that these challenges will often be untreated or undertreated, receiving less than the optimal treatment that someone might benefit from. And this is gonna be particularly true among populations impacted by other kinds of vulnerabilities. We turn now to the relationship between religion and spirituality and mental health. We find that there's actually quite a lot of data out there about this relationship, in part because there are so many aspects and nuances to both religion and spirituality and mental health symptoms. So this data has covered quite a lot of ground of both intrinsic and extrinsic spirituality, different ways it impacts mental health symptoms and longevity and support, et cetera. What this data found though was that overwhelmingly religion and spirituality was positive for mental health. 
Um, there were many different ways that we saw this, but some of the big takeaways were that religion and spirituality was positively associated with lower rates of depression, lower suicidality, lower anxiety, and lower substance use. Now those associations were across the general population, but when we looked to um, more specific subpopulations, we found increased benefit in some. For example, in adolescents, it was found that adolescents did better and had uh, better overall mental health outcomes and psychological outcomes when they had religion and spirituality in their lives. Uh, we found that these associations were particularly strong in lowering the rates of substance use among teenagers. Another population was African Americans who experienced more benefit from, to their mental health from religion and spirituality than others and had a stronger preference for spirituality with their mental health treatment. Now, while this was overwhelmingly positive, there were authors and studies that noted that religion and spirituality was not universally positive and that it actually could be very complex at times. Um, so for example, for religion and spirituality could have mixed impact on individuals who had schizophrenia as it could both help and hurt their spiritual experience of the illness. Um, it could also create really confusing experiences of psychosis. So for example, if someone was having auditory hallucinations and hearing voices speak to them, if the voices were malevolent, someone may interpret them as demons and therefore feel like they're being talked to or attacked by demons, which is spiritually very distressing. Inversely though, if the voices were benevolent, the person may interpret them as angelic, which could spiritually be very affirming and exciting. And then to be told that it's a symptom or to be encouraged to take medication that would take away the voices could be incredibly spiritually distressing. Additionally, I just said that there's a positive association between religion and spirituality and lower suicidality, but more and more research is asking questions about how does this relationship actually work? For example, one study noted that people with religious affiliation may have fewer suicide attempts, but they have similar rates of suicidal ideation. And multiple studies ask the question of, is the religious affiliation part the aspect that helps suicidality? And is it the religious part or simply affiliation and having community? Another theme we found with complexity was spiritual struggle. Spiritual struggle is a normative human experience and it's a time when someone's theological or spiritual or sacred beliefs are in a tension or conflict with one another. Most people experience this at some point, but data found that spiritual struggle could exacerbate all existing mental health symptoms and could cause mental health concerns for those who didn't have it previously. Data also found that spiritual struggle and negative religious coping were associated with increases in frequency and severity of suicidal ideation. This means that spiritual struggle and negative religious coping can actually be a threat to personal safety. Finally, we have to recognize that religious institutions themselves can cause many lifelong impacts to mental health, often through a misuse or abuse of power. This can happen in many different ways where, say, religious leaders or institution engage in coercion and manipulation of congregants and followers, spiritual bypassing where congregants may be taught that certain negative feelings or experiencing or experiences, particularly negative emotions, might be sinful or theologically unacceptable, and through physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, of which we have sadly heard many stories come out in recent years about clergy sexual abuse. Um, a, a particular population that has shown many impacts from religious institutions harm is that the LGBTQ population, which as Rachel said, already experiences higher rates of mental health issues, but also is at higher risk of having a religious adverse event, which can cause lifelong impacts to both mental health and spiritual health. Now, none of these points that I've just raised or these complexities that we've noted undo the fact that religion and spirituality is overwhelmingly positive for mental health. In fact, none of these authors or studies ever suggested that religion and spirituality is, say, dangerous or shouldn't be mixed with mental health. Rather, they all came back to a very similar point, of which this is one example. Our results suggest that the complexity of the relationship between religion and illness requires a highly sensitive approach to each unique story. All of these authors seem to agree that while there could be complexities that needed to be noted and attended to, they could be managed well as long as they were done with nuance. So 
Having reviewed some of the literature about how religion and spirituality impact mental health and well-being, we want to look now a little more specifically at the role of religion and spirituality that they play in mental health treatment. And I think it's fair to say that religion and spirituality have historically been overlooked um, in mental health treatment. We see a history of mistrust, even antagonism between religion and psychiatry and psychology, um, and concerns that religiosity negatively impacts mental well being. Often clinicians haven't received formal training or education on how to address religious or spiritual concerns in treatment. Another challenge is what has been called a religiosity gap. And this refers to the fact that mental health professionals on the whole are much less religious than the clients that they treat. And this gap likely leads to less inherent appreciation or understanding of the role that religion and spirituality play in the lives of many people. Taken together, these factors mean that mental health providers often don't bring up religion or spirituality and might even avoid or dismiss these topics. When this happens, often clients won't bring up religion or spirituality either, um, or might not disclose uh, the religious or spiritual concerns that are impacting their health. So we'll take a bit of a deeper dive on this client perspective and two studies that help us understand how clients themselves feel about the role of religion and spirituality in treatment. A 2021 Oxhandler et al. study conducted a national survey finding among almost 1,000 study respondents that a majority held positive attitudes about integrating religion and spirituality in mental health treatment. Another 2020 study looking at the perspectives of adults in California receiving public mental health services found an overwhelming majority, about 80%, believed that spirituality was important to their mental health. And even though many uh, clients wanted their spirituality to be addressed in treatment, the study found that these conversations were initiated relatively infrequently by mental health providers. Not only was spirituality overlooked, about a third of the study participants went so far as to say their providers did not respect their spirituality. That being said, we do see trends toward greater inclusion of religion and spirituality in mental health treatment. Increasingly, I think religion and spirituality are recognized as important components of health. And there's greater interest in holistic approaches, uh, mind-body practices, and understanding the role of spirituality in healing processes. And even in popular culture, some of these ideas around mindfulness or something like practicing gratitude as being beneficial uh, is something that's reached the level of mainstream media and culture in many cases. One reason for this shift is the increased focus on patient-centered, culturally competent care. Religion and spirituality are part of the social context that impacts people and their health, and providing patient-centered care requires sensitivity to religion and spirituality as elements of human diversity. I'll also mention what's known as the third wave of behavioral therapy. This is a group of treatment approaches that includes acceptance and commitment therapy and mindfulness-based interventions. And as these names suggest, these approaches place uh, greater emphasis on mindfulness, acceptance, personal values, and other themes that are very much related to spirituality. And these components are increasingly normalized in mental health treatment. Um, the contributions of positive psychology have also shifted focus toward not only um, alleviating symptoms, but toward human flourishing and promoting well being through strengths and virtues. And this is a perspective that invites greater openness to religious and spiritual resources and healing. Just one example of these trends is a position statement on religion and spirituality and psychiatry from the uh, World Psychiatric Association. There are other examples of this from different professional organizations. Um, and this particular statement speaks to the need for psychiatrists to be attentive to religion and spirituality as factors that impact mental health. This position statement addresses um, clinical practice, addressing religion and spirituality in clinical practice, as well as in research and education. Some of the more focused efforts to integrate religion and spirituality are approaches known as spiritually integrated treatment. Um, these are treatment approaches that intentionally incorporate elements of religion or spirituality. One example is religious CBT. This is CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that has been adapted to express 
some of the CBT principles through the language and practices of a particular religious tradition, drawing from that religious tradition as a resource in the um, process of treatment. In recent years, a number of different spiritually integrated treatments have been developed and tested. And so far, the evidence has found that these treatments have similar outcomes in terms of psychological well being when compared to standard approaches. However, spiritually integrated treatments do show greater uh, client improvements in terms of spiritual well being. So there seems to be an additional benefit um, in terms of spiritual health with, associated with these treatments that likely makes this a helpful option for um, some people. So to summarize these trends, um, religion and spirituality are increasingly welcomed in mental health treatment. Certainly there are uh, still challenges and barriers that remain, um, but we do see these trends toward greater inclusion in a variety of ways. And there's, um, this is a promising movement that this integration is not only effective, but I think also has the potential to make mental health treatment more inclusive and more supportive for more people. So that gives us a bit of an orientation to how uh, uh, mental health professionals respond to religion and spirituality in mental health treatment. And now I want to look specifically at chaplains. Um, as chaplains, we bring distinct priorities, goals, and values that shape how we provide this care. So we want to look at the literature that's specific to chaplains and how chaplains address religious and spiritual concerns in the context of mental health treatment. To get some perspective on this question around chaplains' work in mental health, we'll take a look at a review article from 2016 on this topic. Um, this article is a little older. Um, it doesn't include publications from about the last 10 years, but it does give us an overview of the kinds of literature that are available. Um, this review study included articles with a specific focus on chaplains or pastoral care providers and was limited to inpatient acute psychiatric settings. After an extensive literature search, the study authors found 49 articles that met these inclusion criteria. So what do we know about these 49 articles? Um, a majority of the, the um, articles that met the inclusion criteria, about two thirds, are identified by the study as non-evaluative reports. These include personal accounts of chaplains describing and reflecting on their work in inpatient psychiatric settings, we also see six studies describing chaplain services and functions like groups, worship services, and um, chaplain's involvement with the interdisciplinary team, as well as four reviews of specific subtopics. Um, these reports do not conduct uh, a research study or involve the collection of data. And so while certainly helpful, the non-evaluative reports reflect a lower level of evidence. The other third of the articles um, are identified by the study as evaluative studies, and these involve the collection and analysis of some kind of data. Five studies collected qualitative and 13 collected quantitative numerical data. These data were most often collected through focus groups and surveys with both patients and staff. Um, and most of these studies in general looked at the spiritual needs of psychiatric patients or at patient and staff perceptions of chaplains. I want to highlight two key themes uh, from this review and the conclusions that uh, it draws. First, we see evidence of unmet spiritual need. Um, even though both religious and non-religious patients wanted spiritual support, patients in these studies often reported that spirituality was not addressed in their treatment. Several studies also found low rates of referrals to chaplains, um, rates that were often much lower compared to how often patients were referred to chaplains outside of psychiatric settings. Another concern was that chaplains reported they often felt ill-prepared to address acute psychiatric problems, and many argued that greater um, chaplain integration and more specialized education were important for chaplains to be able to effectively address this unmet spiritual need. A second key theme to emphasize is the overall lack of data. Um, this review found no outcomes data in any of the published studies. So while chaplains generally describe their work as being helpful, without, uh, without that outcomes data, we might wonder how reliable we are as chaplains in evaluating the efficacy of our own work. We also don't see data to address the concerns expressed by both chaplains and providers that chaplains might exacerbate psychiatric symptoms with religious content. 
And these were important questions that impacted referrals to chaplains as well as chaplain integration on the team. While the review article didn't find any concrete evidence of these harms, the existing literature does, just doesn't give us much to understand what kinds of impacts chaplains might be having and if there are any risks associated with chaplain involvement. So as I said, this article included literature published through 2014. So you might be wondering how the picture has evolved in the last 10 years. So I wanna emphasize three key trends from the more recent literature. Mental health chaplaincy is increasingly an area of focus with chaplains reflecting on, evaluating and describing their work in mental health settings. Just as in the previous study, chaplains are, are writing about how they understand the chaplain role, functions and its impacts. More recently, chaplains are also um, developing and describing chaplaincy approaches in response to complex symptoms or acute illness, um, integrating spiritual care with knowledge and practices from the behavioral sciences. And finally, we see more examples of chaplains writing about chaplain-led or co-led group interventions. And these make important contributions in terms of understanding and advancing our professional practice. In terms of more formal studies, we see um, chaplain case studies, as well as studies gathering data about the perceptions that staff, care recipients, and chaplains themselves have about chaplains in their work. And this literature is generally encouraging because we see care recipients reporting having positive experiences with chaplains and describing that chaplain-led groups are beneficial. More recent research on chaplaincy education has found that chaplain education on mental health is limited, um, finding that only a minority of CPE programs offer educational didactics on topics like behavioral health or on substance use. One of the most significant changes in the field is the work conducted through the Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs, offering some of the highest quality data available on chaplains and mental health. And this work has emerged through efforts to better integrate chaplaincy and mental health services, um, developing strategies to address chaplain integration and education and evaluating um, the impacts of those initiatives. One avenue of study has been how and when service members and veterans engage chaplains for support um, finding that chaplains might be a less stigmatizing form of support than other mental health professionals. Two particular areas of focus are suicide prevention and moral injury, with promising results showing that chaplains can play an important role within uh, mental health care. However, um, it's important to note that this research is generally specific to a very particular population of veterans and service members. Um, these studies are often conducted in specific settings and institutions and within a particular chaplain cohort. So this leaves questions, uh, um, can we generalize this data to other populations, generalize it beyond veterans and service members to what extent? Um, and also we might uh, still have the question about whether or not this care is representative of the care that other groups of chaplains are providing across different mental health settings. So as we think about chaplains work in the context of mental health treatment, we do see signs that chaplains can make positive contributions to care. However, there are many unanswered questions. Um, what kinds of benefits do patients receive from chaplains care and how much benefit do care recipients receive? We also don't see the kinds of evidence that could guide clinical decision-making about what kinds of chaplain interventions are most likely to be effective in particular situations. There are also outstanding questions about chaplain education and competence. To what extent does chaplain education prepare us to provide this care? And what sources of education and information do chaplains draw from to guide and inform this work? So I think we know that chaplains are providing care in mental health settings, but we don't know much about what this care looks like, where or how often it happens, how chaplains understand it, um, and certainly how it's impacting care recipients. We're gonna change directions then just a little bit to look at clergy and mental health. We recognize that we didn't have a lot of information about chaplaincy, we had some, but when we were doing this larger literature review, we realized that clergy came up frequently. And there were a lot of reasons for this. First off in literature, just about religion and spirituality, clergy are a common piece of people's religious or spiritual experiences. So that came up in that larger data. And then there was a trend found that clergy were often seen as less stigmatizing and more accessible resources for people to use for their mental health needs, especially compared to more formal, say, psychiatric treatment. 
therefore clergy was started to be studied a bit more and public health officials launched onto this. They decided to use clergy in multiple public health initiatives as a form of collaboration because this way they could reach populations that didn't trust formal mental health resources, but would trust their own clergy. Because of all of this, there's a lot more research done on clergy. Recognizing that there is a lot of overlap in clergy and chaplaincy training and skill set, and given that we had limited information about chaplaincy, we felt it was worthwhile to dig in a little bit more and see what we can learn about clergy and mental health and how that may help us as chaplains to grow. So the first thing we found is that clergy identify that mental health is a part of their work. Um, this came from a few different perspectives. And the first is simply that mental health came to clergy. Um, they, of course, would often care for their own congregants, but they recognized that just as being a clergy person in their community, people they had never met but knew that they were clergy would reach out to them at times for help with mental health because they trusted that they would be supported. Additionally, though, clergy identified that part of being clergy is caring for others. And a lot of times this was described as counseling, and that was how they saw they were caring for mental health. Now, counseling was a little bit of a tricky word because it was never clearly defined or really explored as what did that mean, what were they doing, what interventions, and so on. And counseling could be really broad. It could be meeting with just one or two people. It could be talking about parenting or marital issues, but it could be talking about mental illness and other uh, support that people needed. But clergy identified that this was a part of their role. Now, rates of referral and collaboration with formal mental health resources varied tremendously among clergy and their particular traditions. Um, it could also vary a lot on some places of worship had their own embedded counseling centers. So some clergy were really quick to refer and collaborate with formal mental health resources. Um, some clergy simply lacked access and some clergy didn't trust them. There was a lot of studies done trying to assess how effective were clergy at caring for mental health. Uh, one of the first themes that these studies found was that clergy had a lack of knowledge and this was coming from clergy themselves. Um, most clergy felt that they were not prepared enough to address mental health needs and that they wanted more education even if they were already really seasoned clergy working in the field. Um, additionally, other studies found that the more that clergy worked and cared for mental health in their roles, the more that they felt seminarians needed specialized training in mental health in order to be ready to care for it. Other studies tried to assess how effective clergy support was, and there were very mixed results. Um, a number of studies tried to assess if clergy could effectively identify when a mental health concern was in front of them. And what they found is that clergy were really good at seeing a very serious mental health concern. So someone was actively suicidal, experiencing a high level of psychosis, et cetera, but that they often missed more moderate cases. So if someone was experiencing depression, they weren't likely to identify it or encourage to get them to get more support, et cetera. Um, they also found that clergy were more likely to make a referral when they had more specialized mental health training or experience. And the concern here was then was that clergy who had less education simply just didn't have awareness of what they didn't know and weren't even thinking to seek that support. And finally, studies found that when clergy advice disagreed with psychiatric advice, so if a psychiatrist encouraged treatment and a clergy person encouraged, say, waiting or praying more, that could cause a pretty significant delay in that person seeking treatment. We've already touched a bit on stigma and how stigma can prevent treatment. Um, stigma is pervasive and normative in society as a whole and clergy are people. So they too carry their own stigma towards mental health, just as people. Um, we found that clergy also had stigma though about working with mental health, particularly having fear, often a fear for their own personal safety and that something may happen to them as they care for mental health. We also encountered stigma coming from various uh, theological understandings of different mental health problems. Now, because this was clergy though, having stigma and carrying it into their work, we saw some different outcomes. For example, um, individuals reported leaving their congregations and sometimes losing connection to their faith entirely due to stigma they experienced from clergy and in their congregations. Some congregants, rather than seeing their clergy as a less stigmatizing resource, actually expressed the opposite. They were so afraid of their clergy stigma against them that they actually had increased psychological distress about it. And finally, there were stories of that 
clergy forced individuals out of congregations when these individuals had mental health concerns as they felt it was simply too much to manage within the congregation. Now, there were a few factors that came through that showed that were to be supportive to clergy. The first one's probably not very surprising based on what we've already heard about chaplaincy and clergy so far, and that was education and training. Um, some public health initiatives, for example, incorporated training clergy about certain aspects of mental health to see if that helped them, and it typically did. Clergy then would have more confidence and felt better about caring for mental health. The other factor that was shown to be supportive was if clergy had personal experience with mental health. This could be in their own self or in a loved one, and it showed that they were more comfortable working with mental health. For example, one qualitative study had a story where a priest shared that he had a sister who had severe mental illness, spent most of her life in psychiatric institutions. So to him, it was quite normative. And then when he went into a parish setting was serving, he observed stigma in his colleagues that he didn't carry himself. And his perception was that congregants were more comfortable seeking him out because he didn't exhibit the same stigma against congregants. So what do we know from this? Um, we see that clergy need and benefit from mental health education and training in their work, which affirms what we were hearing or kind of speculating about from chaplaincy. We also see here though, that clergy can have a strong impact on individuals' spiritual well-being. Okay, we have been talking quite a lot and presenting quite a lot of data. So we're gonna break this down to some conclusions that we draw from this. So the first conclusion that we draw from all of this is that chaplains are caring for mental health in their work, no matter their setting. We showed the stats about prevalence earlier. We see that it's almost normative in the general population to have mental health needs. But then when we look at the populations that chaplains are most likely to be found in, like healthcare, like prison, like universities, and so on, that mental health rates rise even more. Therefore, chaplains need to be prepared to address the mental health needs in each encounter they have with a care recipient, whether or not they're anticipating there to be a mental health concern. Next, we saw that religion and spirituality and mental health have a complex relationship with one another. There are many positive factors to it, but that it also can be very specific and nuanced. Since chaplains are the practitioners that care for religious and spiritual needs, they are inherently engaging in this complex relationship, whether or not they're aware of it. Chaplains then must be able to navigate this in order to prevent potential harm to care recipients. And finally, we saw that chaplain care for mental health likely requires specific competence and training in mental health. Currently, this competence is not a normative aspect of chaplain training or education. All chaplains, therefore, must develop specific mental health competence in order to care for mental health effectively and safely. So this is where we're going to pause for today, having reviewed the evidence, kind of done that first step towards evidence-based care of getting the best available data. When we come back to our next webinar, we're gonna pick up from this and use these conclusions to look at utilizing clinical expertise and how we can incorporate them into the chaplaincy care that we are already providing. Our final webinar will then look at how to take this to a more systematic approach and how to integrate chaplains into the mental health needs of particular settings. Now, that being said, we're not just walking away at this point. We are actually giving a resource out that we hope will be really helpful to chaplains who are wanting to work on that competence in mental health. We've developed a resource that there's multiple ways to get it. Um, if you saw that QR code at the beginning on the Transforming Chaplaincy website, if you're watching the recording of this, it'll be in the description on YouTube. There's a resource that you can download that goes through four different educational strategies that we feel are a very accessible way that chaplains can grow their mental health competence. I'll just review them briefly and why we feel they're really helpful in growing this. So our first strategy is simply getting basic mental health literacy. This is so that if someone says this person has a diagnosis of schizophrenia or they're in a manic phase of bipolar disorder, that has some meaning and something that you can work from just knowing those terms. In the resource, we give uh, links to lots of different organizations that have free education and basics just to help grow that basic understanding and knowledge. A good complement, though, to the first strategy is our second, which is first person accounts. It's one thing to say that someone is having manic symptoms from bipolar disorder, but what does that actually feel like? What does it actually look like? What is the experience like? As chaplains, we meet people, we don't meet symptoms. 
So it's best to hear from people themselves, what is this like? And this should feel really similar to how we do a lot of our chaplaincy work. So we provide lots of links and resources to both um, audio and books that will go through people's first person experiences of their different mental illnesses. Next, we encourage reflection on individual stigma experiences and values around mental health. Um, we have to recognize and own that all of us uh, have stigma around mental health. It's simply part of our society. We have our own experiences with mental health and our own values that we bring to it. And we've seen that when we don't work with this stigma or at least confront some of this in ourselves, especially the unhelpful parts, it can impact our care even when we don't mean it to. So we provide a number of prompts in ways that you can engage in your own reflection about your stigma and experience and values around mental health. And finally, we provide a number of theological and faith resources about mental health. This can be helpful if it's your own particular theological tradition and you're wanting to find resources about it, or if you're caring for people in a particular tradition and you wanna know how does that tradition understand or approach mental health, you can get a number of resources about that and use it in your work for others. Um, we hope that that uh, resource is helpful to you and that you engage with it in the next few months. We are very excited to be coming back in a couple of months to continue this conversation. We're very passionate about this work and helping chaplains provide care to those who need it. In the meantime, though, feel free to reach out to either or both of us. We are here to work together as a community to care for mental health. Um, we're going to use the rest of our time today to answer any questions that may have come up from what we've presented. All right, uh, thank you so much for the presentation and engaging different dimensions and nuances of how spiritual care, spirituality, and mental health uh, intersect. Um, and also thank you for putting this educational resource uh, together. Um, that is really a good pathway for, for anybody to start building their knowledge and, and skill um, uh, base. So I'm going to just go back to the um, attendee questions to uh, engage you with some of the questions coming in. Um, uh, one of the attendees were, uh, was commented, com commented about, uh, I consider spirituality to be part of every person, and religion can be part of a person's spirituality, but is not necessarily so. Does all research combine these to be considered as one, uh, meaning religion and spirituality? And so what what are you seeing in terms of using these terms in different ways or interchangeably i think um one of the big challenges is that the terms are not well defined um and people use these terms in research religion and spirituality in different ways use them to mean different things so i think this is um uh one of probably one of the the big challenges in in terms of research is um having clear and, and precise definitions um because what you know, we know that these are um, these are things that are so complex and multifaceted, right? Mm -hmm. And I think part of it comes down to the particular study. Um, you know, if, what were they looking at? Were they looking at religious affiliation? Were they looking at if someone was prayerful? Were they looking at spiritual struggle? So specific studies would often have to get very specific about what they were studying. But then when we're taking this big view, yeah, it kind of does collapse into each other a bit, which can be complicated. Yeah. And I think the next question, relates to that um but the person is asking about you know when you're talking about spiritual needs are you talking about beliefs or religious uh needs of the person or are you talking about meeting the needs of the person being of the person more I, i'm assuming more the existential and and uh general spiritual needs and um so i think that what you're seeing around religion and spirituality and it's not very well defined and very well uh delineated in the in the uh, literature um, the same person is asking about what are the differences between qualitative evidence and quantitative evidence? And I would add in terms of what you have reviewed in terms of uh, uh, spirituality and mental health. What are you seeing in terms of the methods that people have you know, applied? Um, kind of what do you see in terms of the implications of quantitative, qualitative uh, studies that you have looked at so far? Um, I'm, I'm a little unclear about um, yeah. the question. Um, we we kind of drew in a lot of different um, 
disciplines and looked at a lot of different questions. So um, I think if it maybe were a little more specific to, um, if this is like specific to the literature on chaplains yeah. um, or one of the other pieces that we touched on today. Yeah. yeah. And, and in, in generally speaking, uh, quantitative and qualitative evidence complement each other. Uh, so it's it's part of the diverse way of doing research and one might be more suited for really digging into people, people's lived experiences and getting the nuances and have more limitations about how how far, how well they can be generalized. And then having uh, quantitative studies with surveys and larger sample sizes that are um, maybe more present, representative and more uh, generalizable to a larger population. Uh, but I think in my view, always go hand in hand in terms of building a strong evidence base uh, for, for anything. And I can, the other research related question is, uh, would writing a case study be a good way to start doing research on chaplaincy and spiritual care in patient, uh, within patient mental health patients? Yeah, and there are a few case studies out there um, already about some of this. Um, so feel free to read those as a way to launch off writing your own. Um, and this has been a big need in um, spiritual care research to have more case studies just to better understand what chaplaincy care looks like and how it works. And that's an excellent recommendation to to read a few case studies that have been published um, in some of our journals, some of the chaplaincy journals and some of the books, and that helps you kind of uh, you know organize your thoughts about a, a case study. And if you have a strong case study, you know you don't have to wait until a book is getting published, but also submitting to any of the chaplaincy journals uh, could be a good avenue to to get that case study out there. Um, um, uh, another attendee is commenting on uh, the stigma against receiving mental health services is particularly high amongst the African American population, and particularly among uh, among men. Um, there's not a question attached to that, it, but it's a really important point. And and what have you seen in the in the research that you've looked at in terms of um, um, persons from different ethnic, racial, uh, and other backgrounds? Um, yeah, I know. Um, I think among some, um, I think the the lowest rates for treatment seeking are among Asian American adults, where the um, it's about twenty percent of people that receive treatment, which is just sort of an astonishing um, number to reflect on, and how much um, just to kind of imagine that that level of suffering and um, that's going unmet, right, unaddressed in treatment. Um, so I I would emphasize both stigma and barriers um to receiving care um certainly if if people have um you know experienced uh inequities in seeking care for any type of health care that will impact um the treatment seeking behavior around any sort of um problem health problem and the next question is uh um, switches to competencies and and learning and i think that's going to be been further explored and and it's just general, just a plug-in, like we would love to continue this line of conversation, you know, uh, in terms of training and preparation and increasing competencies among chaplains for caring with uh, caring for patients uh, with mental health conditions. Um, so the question goes, beyond the competencies and skill sets learned from CPE, are there competencies and skill sets identified that are unique to mental health chaplaincy? Uh, for chaplains who are interested in this specialization, where do they go for training? I think it's a very, very, common question so let you address it <laughs> it, it is um, and I don't know if we have the best answer because I, I think we're still trying to figure out that answer ourselves to an extent um, definitely the resource we put together is coming from our practical wisdom um, I think it's fair to say for both of us we never really had training um, we just kind of jumped in um, we worked in a hospital that had a lot of behavioral health um, units so we got to just figure it out and do it um, one thing I am really excited about that may not be the most formal training, but might be still a great thing to do is joining this research network um, because both it'll be giving new information, <clears throat> engaging in research, which will be great, but it'll also be community. Um, I think that that's one of the biggest challenges chaplaincy has had around mental health is that there are lots of chaplains doing this work, but we're siloed. We don't talk to each other. And so there's so much collective wisdom that's just not being shared amongst us um, that could really help with some of that training and growth. Um, and I will talk a little bit more in the next webinar about how we do bridge certain competence into the skill sets that we already have. 
Um, and chaplains already have a lot of the skills they need to be really successful around mental health. It's just knowing how to use them. Right. Thank you. Uh, and I think the next question kind of continues that and kind of looks a little bit, you know, at uh, the professional practice and specialization in the mental health care. Um, the, the question or the comment in the question uh, goes as NACC does have a designation and I think APC2 for palliative care and, and mm -hmm. uh, specialty uh, certification. Do you recommend that APC or NACC or similar organizations develop uh, specialty certification uh, for mental health? Um, and then again, the training, are there other organizations that might provide training about mental health? But kind of this specialty certification idea, what, what are your thoughts about? Um, sorry, I don't, uh, oh, don't ahead, want to talk. put you on, um, I think it's, I, I think it's a little bit of a challenge to sort of conceive of a, a specialty certification at this point, because I don't think we really have a consensus around what does it mean to be a, a chaplain in mental health. Um, my observation is, you know, I think many of us just found ourselves in, or in a mental health setting and sort of have, um, sort of found our own ways of integrating our and applying our spiritual care uh, training and expertise and in, in using that um, in, a, in a mental health setting to address the needs of the, the individuals and the, and the systems we're caring for. Um, but I don't know that we really have um, a shared understanding of what, uh, what does this work mean? What does it look like? How do we know if it's effective or not effective? Sort of what are the boundaries around um, spiritual care uh, involvement in mental health relative to other professional disciplines. Um, I think those 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 questions sort of need to precede the question about um, specialty certifications until we, you know, have that shared understanding of what is it, you know, what is it that this we think that this looks like before we can evaluate who has that, uh, who has, you know, developed um, that competence. Right, um, and to draw a distinction between the already existing palliative and hospice care certifications, some of the requirements are speaking to things that are pretty objective or concrete, like you have to get a certain amount of training and there's always options you can already go to to get this training about palliative and hospice care. Um, I'm blanking on the name, unfortunately, but there's the eight tenets of like palliative care and you have to speak to all of these things. And this is like worldwide. This is not APC or NACC adopting or making them up themselves. So there's this really big thing that it can latch on to and behavioral health is so different um, that there's so much more contextualization. We don't quite have those same big things that we can latch on to yet. So someday, sure, there'd be, I'd be all for it. It's just that, like Rachel said, we, we kind of have a few big steps in the middle that we have to do first. Yeah. And we are kind of staying with this uh, question of competencies and training. Um, uh, training is important, as you mentioned. Do you see any opportunities for CP programs to integrate mental health trainings and tools for chaplains? Well, um, actually, there is a program that we came across a research study for that is incorporating um, suicide protocols so that if there's anyone in that hospital who um, there was a self-harm survey or screening done that they marked high enough, it automatically triggered a spiritual care consult. And part of that was for the CP program and that they did a lot of intentional didactics around um, suicide prevention or meeting people who are might be engaging in self-harm. And um, we actually reached out to that site. It was really cool to hear about the work that they're doing. And, and I think at the time we both thought like that would maybe be a great project lots of hospitals could implement. Um, we do think that certainly in CPE, it'd be great to have um, didactics and just trying to normalize that behavioral health is there. Um, I think a great way could be just calling it out in verbatims, even if you're in a site that doesn't have, say, an inpatient psychiatric unit, where might there be behavioral health issues occurring in a verbatim that you're presenting, for example. And there are many opportunities to, to various extent, to in, incorporate mental health information in CP programs. Um, um, on Monday, you heard from Angelica Zolfrank, and, and her CP program is completely in a psychiatric hospital. There are some second-year fellowship specializations in mental health. But in the basic units and a basic residency of CP, I think there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of programs, different ways, including that. Uh, George Fitcher chimed in that in terms of certifications, that there are specialty certifications for behavioral health and addiction in the Veterans Administration uh, healthcare mm -hmm. system for chaplains that are both uh, for training and certifications. 
Um, and there's a there are a lot of comments also coming in, just uh, saying thank you and uh, and and the wonderful presentation, um, and 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 a lot of engagement from our audience. I hope uh, again we continue this conversation as part of the mental health research network. You know, all across clinical practices, how the evidence inform our practice, what competencies, what uh, training opportunities there are out there for chaplains to to grow in this area. So if you haven't, and if you're interested, the link in the chat, and you have seen this link uh, uh, over this uh, week, go to that web page, scroll down. There is some more information about our mental health research network. Uh, sign up to get uh, to the first network meeting to, to engage these uh, topics and, and also envision kind of next steps for the network. Uh, so thank you again, uh, Kristen and Rachel. It was great to have you uh, on. I really look forward to part two and part three next year, and uh, stay tuned. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today.